So good morning and welcome again. I can't tell you how pleased I am that you have chosen to spend your time with us here this morning. Your home. Have you seen the movie Home Alone? That is the first movie, Home Alone. It's a fantastic movie. It has zero intellectual content and it's all fun and it's just what we all need now. In fact, if you don't find any spiritual sustenance in my sermon here today, I suggest you just click over to Home Alone. Uh, maybe you'll get some spiritual sustenance there and perhaps this is one of the great advantages to going uh, to church and still being at home. So many of you know because you've seen this movie, but if you haven't, uh, it's the story of an eight-year-old boy who accidentally gets left behind when everybody's hurrying out for Christmas vacation. Each parent thinks the other parent has the kid. Now, I've heard a lot of people comment on this, uh, this portion of the plot, and personally, I find it completely plausible. We have five kids, as you may or may not know. And we left these kids all over the place. You know, one at a bowling alley in Solon. We left a kid at the church. How about a karate studio? We left a dog at a rest stop. You know, it, this sort of thing happens. I do want you to know that we do have all of our kids, and they're all accounted for, not to worry. In fact, some of them are home right now sleeping through their dad's sermon. Back to the plot. So uh, this boy is home alone. They figure it out when they're on the plane to Florida. A blizzard sets in in Chicago. They can't get back, so he's home alone. And while he's home alone, two bungling burglars uh, try to break in the house, and this eight-year-old boy outsmarts them. Fantastic story. So I tell you about that at the beginning of the sermon because that's actually how I think about what we're up to. I think we're all home alone regardless of how many people are in your household or whether or not you share it with a cat or a dog or a reptile, right? So instead of a blizzard, we got ourselves a pandemic. And uh, instead of bad guys trying to break into our house, we got like this bad virus that we're trying to keep out of the house. And we have this stream of bad news that uh, seems to be breaking into our house, right? You know, economic crisis, health crisis, and now we have really a burgeoning mental health crisis. So meanwhile, we are all contending to contain this virus, which we cannot see. In fact, I heard that if we collected all the virus in the world, it would weigh less than one gram. So we have, we're contending with that. We're, we're contending with uh, the terrible economic consequences of shutting down the economy and we're contending with this stream of news, we're worrying about ourselves, we're worrying about our loved ones, we're worrying about our neighbors, and we're worrying about tens and tens and tens of thousands of people we have never met before. All those who are exposed to the virus, those who are on the, the bottom of the social pecking order, which are taking the greatest brunt for this, all those workers in hospitals and daycare centers, uh, and we're wondering if we're ever gonna get back to normal. So, you know, like the parable, which as it says, even in the parable as Jesus unfolds it, uh, Jesus uses this figurative language of thieves and bandits. And I do believe that uh, these thieves and bandits, in our case, are not real thieves and bandits. They're kind of psychic thieves and bandits. And like the robbers in the movie, they, they try to break into our consciousness in any way possible over the wall, through the window, uh, particularly for me, uh, maybe uh, in the middle of the night if I wake up, uh, perhaps just before I go to sleep or some people experience it at the dawn, this, 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 this ugliness where you, you feel that the thiever bandit is going to steal your hope or your sanity or your positive thinking or your good disposition. And we're all like that eight-year-old boy kind of trying to outsmart all the bad stuff that could be happening inside our psychic lives. And, uh, period. and we do a pretty good job. I'm just going to say that. I don't know exactly how your psychic life is going, but I would say you're probably doing a really pretty good job. But sometimes we get cranky, we get brittle, we get anxious, we get off our game. We're not ourselves, right? Uh, and we have to say, you know what? there really is a kind of deadening effect to all of this. There's a kind of life-draining aspect to this life-threatening, economic-threatening virus that we're all contending with. So just like a good Western, right? 
the Calvary starts to show up. And the Calvary starts to show up not in the way that you might be thinking, but the Calvary shows up this morning with the gospel. We're so blessed to have John's gospel coming to us during this season of the pandemic. John's gospel is sometimes known as the gospel of life. So just to give you a sense of that in the scriptures, so the three synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they use the word life 16 times. John's gospel uses the word life 36 times. And if you took all the Johannine, all the John literature, the gospel, the letters, and the book of Revelation, you get 66 times. We can see this particularly in parables. So much, so many of the readings we get during the so-called ordinary life of our season are parables that come from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But if we look at this, we see that in the synoptic gospels, the topic of the parables is the kingdom of God. But when we look at the parables in John's gospel, the topic of the parables is Jesus and the life that Jesus gives. John even tells us right at the end of the gospel that life is the purpose for the writing of the gospel. He says that uh, he has written all this, that you may have life in his name. In other words, that we may have life in Jesus' name, his name being his being and his essence is in his who he isness, right? That's what we mean by saying in his name or hallowed be thy name. In John's gospel, Jesus is life. He is that human life that also has deeply bound, fully human and fully divine, the divine life, eternal life, the life that God lives immersed in his human life. And Jesus even tells us, again in John's gospel, right? I am the way and the life, and I am the way and the truth and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. And he goes on to say, the words that I have spoken are spirit and life. And John even tells us that the very purpose of the incarnation, the very purpose of, of the whole thing, the reason that, that the Messiah, the Christ, came to earth is to give us this life. It is all about this life. And then today, we hear as part of the scripture, and I'm going to use the, the former translation, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. It's all about life. Now, the abundant life that Jesus came certainly transcends the pandemic. I mean, Jesus did not say, I have come that you may have life unless, and have it more abundantly, unless there's a pandemic, right? mm also, it transcends our economic issues, right? Uh, the abundant life that Jesus came to give us is not dependent upon the economy. The abundant life is not some sort of divinely empowered consumerism where we can have everything we want. It is certainly not the so-called prosperity gospel that is preached in some churches. And the abundant life is not defeated by a downturn in the economy or the ups and downs of the stock market. The abundant life that Jesus came to give us is not a bucket list of 50 things I need to do before I go six feet under. And it is not about being a Renaissance woman or a Renaissance man and being able to do it all. That is not the abundant life that Jesus is talking about. The abundant life that Jesus came to give us is our participation in divine life. Right? That is... Uh, different than the so-called natural life, which comes in the Greek from the word what we get psyche from. Natural life ends in death. The abundant life or eternal life that Jesus is talking about does not end in death. Its liveliness surpasses even death, right? And for Christians, we understand that this life comes through relationship in Jesus, as we might say, in Christ. So, as I mentioned at the outset of today's uh, service, today is Good Shepherd Sunday. So, how is it that in Good Shepherd Sunday, you know, what can we learn from Good Shepherd Sunday? What can we learn from the readings about the nature of this abundant life in Christ, in this relationship with Christ? The gospel that I just read is really incredibly complex. 
It's really two parables that have been yoked together. The first about the sheep gate and the second about the shepherd and the sheep. So let's just take a bit and a piece and a part of some of these parables and some of these teachings and see how they might apply to us now here during this season of pandemic. So it says uh, uh, in the parable that the shepherd calls the sheep by name. So in the Bible, what's in a name? Well, the answer is everything, right? The essence, to be called by your name is to know your essence. And so how does that apply to us here and now? And I think it comes down to this question. Can you believe that Jesus knows your essence? Do you believe that the life that Christ is knows your life, right? Now, this is a penetrating and an unbelievably important question for, for each of us to contend with because the way we answer that question, what our expectations are, may well determine our capacity for profound religious experience. It may determine our capacity for spiritual intimacy. We may say, oh, I have never had any spiritual experiences, but perhaps our predispositions have closed the door to such a thing. And I will say, no doubt, that for many of us, many of you, and some of you very particularly, it takes a tremendous amount of courage to open yourself up to the possibility of of Christ-like experience in your life. You look around and you say, no, 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 I see what some of these people are like, I don't want that, or maybe I do want that, or it just isn't possible, I don't buy it. So in the, in the figurative language of, of the parable this morning, I ask you, uh, do you have the courage to believe that Jesus is not just the good shepherd to the herd, right, to everybody, but is the good shepherd to you. Do you have that kind of courage to believe that? And do you believe that Jesus can be personal to you and not just you being personal to Jesus? It is very possible to have a personal but one-way relationship with Jesus and uh, in a sense not to expect anything from him, right? You can have faith and belief and devotion in Christ and not really expect that Jesus has faith, belief, and devotion in you. And you can believe that, that, that Christ is kind of like that loving, avuncular presence in your life. You know, that uncle that you know loves you, but really has nothing to do with your daily life. But it is a whole and completely different thing if you believe that Jesus can and is responding to you in real time. So it says also in the parable uh, that the sheep know his voice. The sheep know the voice of the shepherd. And here I'd like to take a page out of the yogic playbook and think of voice as vibration. And I'd like to take a song out of the Beach Boys playlist and go to that one of those songs of my childhood, Good Vibrations, Right? Good Vibrations uh, has the over and over chorus, I'm picking up good vibrations, she's giving me excitations. So excitations, right, to excite, to energize, or to stimulate. Most assuredly, the Beach Boys are talking about sexual stimulation. I'm talking about spiritual stimulation. So when we figuratively hear that Hearing his voice, which is what it says in the parable, I believe we should be thinking about sensing his vibrations, sensing his energy with our spiritual senses. So, for example, we might experience those vibrations and that energy and that stimulation through a warming of the heart. Remember, uh, the man, one of the men who created uh, the Methodist movement talked about a strange warming in his heart. We may find that there is a kind of uh, uh, surge of the life of the Spirit in our lives. We may just <sighs> take a profound deep breath uh, and feel a letting go 
we might have what is known as a, a mountaintop experience, a, a sense that the whole world uh, has come together and you can be at peace and see all of that. You may have an inner voice. You may have a thought that floats by that seems to contain something of the divine. You may have a locution or a, a, a movement of love, a movement of peace, right? A movement of, 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 of just a sense that you're in the flow of God. You're in the divine flow. You're doing what you're supposed to be doing. You And like a stream of living water, it's just shooting right through you. And you may also have a sense that you are profoundly okay, even though when you look around and everything's not okay at all. But somehow, way deep down, you're okay. Or this vibration, this excitation may come through the voice of a friend, a loved one. Earlier this week, I was really struggling. And I sat slumped at my desk at home, and I was exhausted. I was completely drained, and I put my head on my desk, and I just, I just, there was nothing left. I was exhausted and drained because somebody I love was struggling such that I just absorbed the struggle. This wasn't, in some sense, even my struggle, but out of love, I absorbed this struggle. So I called my spiritual director, and we talked about, we talked about a lot of things, and then I said, you know, I've got to tell you something. And I told them what was happening to this person and what was happening to me and how I felt. And he was crystal clear, without missing a beat. He said, the love of Christ is an empathetic love. He has empathy for you. And let him be empathetic to you. And let him, let him love you in that empathy. And let him carry some of the burden that you feel. And then he said, he also has empathy for the one you love. Just see that and let him carry that person a little bit as you're trying to carry this person. You can rest in love, but you can rest in love in a way that doesn't remove the pain. He said, what you're experiencing is the wound of love, and the wound of love is painful. It's the underbelly of love. We see this underbelly of love when loved ones die, when loved ones get sick, when loved ones struggle, and we feel this pain. He said, but of all people who know woundedness, certainly our Lord can help bear the wound of love that you have. So part of this movement of the Spirit in our lives, part of this embrace of the spiritual senses, the opening of the heart and the soul to the possibility that, that you are loved in Christ, in the present, in now, is to come to understand that Jesus knows you deeply. This is a little bit of what happens when you pray with icons, an icon particular of the face of Christ. I mentioned this in my video on uh, the 10 habits to stay calm and carry on. So when you're praying with icons, and particularly with the face of Christ, I mean, the big deal is not that we're looking at Christ's face, right? That's our devotion. That's the one-way relationship. But the big deal is the eyes of Christ look back at you. That's the two-way relationship. And not only do they look at you, but they look into you, right? These eyes of love, these eyes of care, these eyes of empathy look inside the home alone. They go into the deepest part of your home where, where you guard and don't let people in. But these eyes see and these eyes know and they have empathy for what is going on in the depths of your soul. And these eyes hold what is happening in the depths of your soul. You see, Jesus has compassion for you. He has compassion for all of your loved ones. And he has compassion for those tens of thousands that we know not but worry over. Those out of work, those exposed to the virus, those who have to be bus drivers in Manhattan, those essential workers that nobody paid any attention to until suddenly they became the most important people 
and they don't have the possibility of staying at home and doing their work from a nice little library. They have to go out, and we worry about this. But let Jesus care for you. Let Jesus love you. Let Jesus care for your loved ones, and let Jesus care for those who you do not know. There is a lot of (laughs) <laughs> the virus is still out there, folks. Even though we, we can hardly stay inside, the virus is still out there. And there's a lot of deadening news that just pours into our homes without ceasing. But do not let that virus and do not let that deadening news take over your home. You are the boss of your home. You may be home alone, but invite the life of Christ into that home. Do not hang out with the deadening stuff. Let your life be dominated by the life-giving life of Jesus the Christ. It may sound crazy. It just happens to be true. This man, in the power of the Spirit, can be present and is present to you with eyes of love. And I'm telling you what, give it a risk. Open up your spiritual senses and just set your heart on those good vibrations and set your heart on those excitations. It can really change everything.